Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the first webinar of the 2022-2023 EMOS webinars program. Uh, my name is Caterina Giusti, and I'm Associate Professor of Statistics at the University of Pisa in Italy. As a member of the EMOS team of my university, I'm working at the organization of this webinar program on behalf of Eurostat, together with the German company Startup. Today, I will look at the webinar moderator. Uh, now, let me first explain for any newcomers that EMOS stands for the European Master in Official Statistics, a joint project of universities and data producers in the EU member states, EFTA, and EU candidate countries. If your university is interested in applying for the EMOS label, please consider that the permanently open call for universities is available on the EMOS dedicated page on the Eurostat website. To stay in contact with the EMOS news and community, please follow the EMOS on Twitter. The Twitter handle is at EU underscore EMOS. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Emanuele Baldacci, who will be hoping the webinars program. Emanuele is director responsible for corporate operation and statistical innovation at Eurostat. So Emanuele, now the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Caterina, and uh, welcome uh, and good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very glad on behalf of Eurostat uh, to open this uh, new series of uh, EMOS uh, uh, webinars. EMOS, uh, as Caterina mentioned, is a network of uh, uh, 34 master programs in 18 European countries. And we in Eurostat uh, and uh, also in the rest of the European statistical system, which is composed of the statistical authorities in Europe, uh, are very much supporting this initiative, as this is a, a very important way to first of all create capacity in official statistics. We constantly need uh, new generations of uh, uh, students that learn the basics of official statistics, uh, but also bring a new knowledge in terms of the frontier of methods and technologies to make uh, the production of official statistics uh, uh, more timely, higher quality and more fit for the future. So this is a constant uh, uh, strive that collectively together with the network of universities that are part of EMOS we are working towards. But we also want to reach beyond this uh, uh, specific circle and talk to all those professionals, uh, citizens who are interested in uh, the topics related to uh, official statistics, uh, the ethical, technical, organizational aspects uh, uh, that are related to that. We live in a world where there is uh, always uh, data, figures, uh, numbers uh, everywhere, and this can create confusion, sometimes can create uh, myths, disinformation. So having uh, trustworthy statistics that you can rely upon that are transparent, that are based on strong methods uh, is, is very, very important. But as you will see in the a webinar that is about to start, the important, uh, uh, is the important aspects are not just the production of uh, uh, good statistics. We also need to have a good understanding in the population at large of what the key concept of uh, uh, the production of data, the interpretation of statistics uh, are. And this is what uh, is labeled data literacy. And uh, uh, Katarina Schuller uh, in a minute uh, will uh, guide us through the ins and outs of uh, uh, what data literacy means uh, for all of us. I want to say that we wanted to open this webinar series with this topic because uh, statistics is for everyone. It's not just for the professionals and data literacy is very important uh, as uh, a key element to enable citizens to live in a democratic society where information plays uh, such a key role. With this, uh, I would like to uh, finish and my very short uh, um, introduction, but just saying that uh, uh, this webinar is the first in a series we will cover uh, in the next uh, uh, webinars uh, other topics that are relevant for the present and the future of statistics. Some of the topics will be more of technical nature, methodological nature. Some of the topics will be more uh, oriented towards users, and we hope that they will be uh, all of uh, interest, both for the students and for the community at large that is uh, accessing uh, these uh, uh, webinars. 
I hope that you can learn through these uh, uh, webinars and particularly the one that we are uh, opening uh, now and that you can also engage uh, proactively asking questions, making comments and also continuing the discussion beyond uh, the seminar. With this, uh, let me stop by uh, uh, starting to thank uh, uh, Katerina and all the speakers that will come after her uh, and uh, share their knowledge and expertise with all of you and also to the, all the participants for uh, being part uh, of this event and the next one, hopefully, and inviting you to uh, join also the other webinars and participate actively to the discussion. Uh, thanks and enjoy the webinar. Back to you, Caterina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emanuele, for this introduction. So yes, now it's time to start with our webinar. And before I give the floor to our speaker, let me first briefly explain how we run the webinar today. As you can see, this year, the Hemos webinar stream on Zoom. Uh, the webinar is recorded and the recording will, will be uploaded on the EMOS YouTube channel, uh, where you can also find already the recorded of all our past webinars and also of the last two EMOS uh, um, workshops. Uh, as a participant in this session, you can watch and listen to the webinar. You can also use the Q&A manager to pose your question to the presenter during the webinar. Uh, our speaker will be answering to question on three occasions today, two times during a speech, and one as part of the final discussion. Should you have any technical problem or issue, please send a message in the Q&A, and you will be contacted by one of the members of the technical staff. So today, I have the pleasure to host Catalina Schuller, Managing Director of the Munich-based company Startup. Catalina is a German entrepreneur, board member of the German Statistical Society, specialized in data strategy and data analysis, and the teaching of data literacy and data ethics. In 20, 2020, she initiated the development of the Data Literacy Charter under the sponsorship of the German Donuts Association, a joint initiative started by Companies and Foundation, the only one in Germany to be devoted entirely to consulting, networking, and promoting improvements in the fields of education, science, and innovation. In 2021, the Standard Association of the IEEE the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity, appointed her to lead an international working group to develop a global standard for data and AI literacy. That is something that actually uh, Katarina will present today. So today she will present indeed about the framework and application for data literacy and um, AI. So, Katarina, now the floor is yours. I will be back uh, at the first break uh, to collect for you uh, any questions that we may receive by the participants. Thank you very much, Katarina and Emanuele, for the introduction. It is my pleasure to open the 2022 AMOS webinar series with the webinar on data and AI literacy. And I will give you a short introduction in the framework, the concept of data and AI literacy, and also give you an idea how this can be applied in several different contexts. I will start with a short overview. Um, this is not, it does not start with the beginning of data literacy, but it starts with uh, a huge milestone that we developed in Germany it was the called HFD Data Literacy Framework. HFD stands for Hochschulforum Digitalisierung. It's a think tank for German universities. And we started developing a competence framework based on a systematic review. And in 2020, we also published an English version that got widely recognized and is now the foundation for uh, several data literacy courses in more than two dozen German universities. Then in 2021, we started the Data Literacy Charter um, together with the Stifterverband, um, which is the German Donors Association, the German Statistical Society, and many more, also in a German and English version. And shortly after that, we published an app, which is called Stadtland Datenfluss. It's a very common German game. And it was developed by the German Adult Education um, Association and sponsored by the German Ministry of Education and Research. And it's under the patronage of the former federal chancellor, Dr. Angela Merkel. It got multiple awards like App of the Month July, the Communist Edu Media Award and several others. This app was also published as a massive open online course on AI campus. 
which is the German learning platform for artificial intelligence, but it also includes some courses in English, English and one of another course that we developed together in a European cooperation project is called data informed decision making in a pandemic, which will also be one of my application examples. And as Katerina already said, we are now working on an international standard um, with IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers and their Standards Association, also with several partners. Now I will start with some background, the research, and give you an overview on the HFD data literacy framework. First, I would like to start with a common misunderstanding on data-informed decision-making or, or so terms like data science or data literacy. Um, even though the terms start with data, the process does not start with data. The process starts with the question in the real world because data science is science and science starts with a question. And that means we also need to have, always need to have in mind the relationship between real world and the data that we collect in the real world, the data that reflects information in the real world. And when we collect measure data, observe data, or whatever from the real world, this is, can be seen as a coding process where context is removed. And then the data is analyzed um, with statistics or with artificial intelligence, with machine learning methods and so on. And then it's interpreted so that it can be applied in the real world. And this is a decoding process. So it needs to be understood what's in the data, what's the meaning of the data. And this can vary depending on the context. And this is also a big source of misunderstandings that we always should keep in mind. I will go to this um, soon in more detail, but this is just to give you a short overview how this cycle works. When we talk about future skills or 21st century competencies, and I see data literacy as a 21st century competence, then um, the common understanding now is that those skills should have at least th should have three dimensions. And the first dimension is, is the specific knowledge, which is the K in the KSA for KSSAV model, knowledge that is related to the competence. Then we need abilities and skills to apply this knowledge, so to do the things in the right way. And then finally, we need an attitude, attitudes, values, and ethics, which, mean, which means the willingness to do the right things. That means corresponding values and attitudes. This is also something we included in the data literacy charter. And to show you how this can be applied or how this is already applied in practice, I would like to give you a short example from, from the industry. Um, as you will see on this slide, there is a lot of content and I will not read every detail, but you will get the slides afterwards and um, you can download them and then you can read that. What I want to show here is how this um, process um, can be applied in a setting of predictive maintenance, which is the real world question. How can we do predictive maintenance um, with our maintenance objects? And this starts in the real world with defining a requirement. Here it's the requirement document for a maintenance object and um, then there are some tasks that need to be done to transform this requirement into data. So some of the tasks are use standardized terms, collect data in an automated process and merge unstructured data from different data pro procurers, which means there are some competencies needed like dealing with structured and unstructured data, checking assumptions and data quality and safe handling of databases. This is about acquiring data. Once you have acquired the data, you need to organize them. You have the raw data, which is a data table with structured data. And this needs to be prepared, cleaned, and outliers need to be detected, which also requires certain competencies. Once the data is organized, you have smart data, which can then be analyzed. Smart data means the information is validated, um, it's cleaned, and it can be um, or analyzed with statistics or with uh, other algorithms. Once you have analyzed the data, that means determined factors that affect the maintenance requirements and maybe also if, after you've done some forecasts, um, there is knowledge. Knowledge is the product after this step. This knowledge describes relations between some features, property features, location characteristics, and it's also um, it also might include some forecasts for maintenance, for the maintenance process. It needs to be evaluated and delivered. That means it needs to be turned into action. And the last thing 
the last data product that we get is an actionable, which is a recommendation on the maintenance cycles and storages related to the maintenance strategy. And here we are close back to the real world. That means there is a task to derive different maintenance strategies and to evaluate the cost of the process, which means you do not only need data knowledge, but also tech understanding of the technical relations and some planning competence. So this in short, we named this here, the information value cycle to put more focus, not on the raw data, but on the information that we want to gain from the data and finally the knowledge and the actionable. So if we take all this together and think about how should the framework for data literacy look like, we can derive certain requirements. Some of the requirements um, are related to the competence framework itself. That means the framework should cover all the stages of this information value cycle or the value creation process from data, as you've seen in my slide before. And also the competence dimensions should be covered. The competence dimensions are the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes, values, and ethics. So it's not only about describing certain knowledge, it's also about describing which attitude should you have when you deal with data and why is ethics so important. When we describe or when we derive a competence framework, it should also be more than just an abstract description of some competencies. It should be able, or it should be capable to be operationalized. That means the competencies should be translated into very specific and also testable, measurable learning objectives and competency objectives. I will give you an example how we did this in one of the applications. Regarding the measurement of the competence, there are certain areas and stages that should be covered. Um, if you measure a competence, it should not only cover the cognitive learning areas, but also the effective learning areas that are related to attitudes, values, and ethics. And we should have a look at the certain learning stages, which is, um, in theory, it's easy, but in practice, it's really difficult because what we usually measure is just reaction. Is someone interested in, in, in a topic and the learning success, for example, with a multiple choice test? But what we really want to achieve is a change of behavior in real life and the results. So, for example, will a city, will a municipality really take better decisions for, for their inhabitants once uh, the people who work there are more data literate? But this is the result that we want to achieve. And finally, measurement is also about the applicability. So there should be transparency regarding possibilities and limitations of um, inferring competencies from observable behavior. There should be the classical criteria like validity, reliability, and objectivity. And we should look at the cost-benefit ratio. So um, it should be um, it should be able uh, people who test should be able to do this with a within a certain time frame and with um, a certain knowledge. So it shouldn't be too difficult to test or measure the competencies. And finally, data literacy is a very interdisciplinary competency, and this should be also reflected in the framework. We describe this in four questions. The first question is, what do I want? This refers to the domain expert. As I said, science starts with a question. It's about the real world. What can I do with data? This refers to the data expert and covers, for example, um, available data, its quality, but also available methods. Third, what am I allowed to do? This is about data protection and other regulatory requirements, for example, data licenses. And finally, what should I do? This is about data ethics. This is um, the way how we brought this into the data literacy framework. Um, it's a really a small expansion of that cycle that I showed in the beginning, but it starts with a system, a system in the real world, which can be a research area, but it can also be a city, it can be an airport, whatever, something in the real world, which is, which consists of objects and their relationships, and those objects have measurable characteristics. Um, the first step in the data literacy framework is the competence area of establishing a data culture. That means identifying data use cases, specifying them and coordinating them. Once we have the objects and their measurable characteristics, it's important to provide the data that means to measure the characteristics of the objects, which consists of three substages, which is plan, plan the data provisioning process, 
obtain the data and finally prepare the data, which also includes verifying and pre-processing. Once we have the data, they can be exploited with certain methods of analysis, but also visualization and verbalization. That means bringing data into text, communicating data. And then in the end, at the end of this coding process where we remove context, we will have a data product, which can be a statistics or the result from an algorithm or a visualization. Once we have that, we go back and interpret those those data products. For example, we interpret uh, the, res the, re the results of regression analysis. And one of the questions could be, is an R square of 0.9, is that good or bad? And as you obviously see, this depends on the context. In social sciences, an R square of 0.9 is pretty good. In physics, an R square of 0.9 might be pretty bad. So it really depends on the science, on the area of science. Then it's about interpreting the data. Is the data reliable? Is it biased? Is it representative? And finally, um, derivation of actions and acting within the system, which also includes the last step that is often forgotten, which means you have to evaluate the impact. So did it really work what we forecasted with the data? I will give you two short examples how those competencies in the framework look like. So they are um, written down in tables, have a labeling, that means a name and a short description. And then we collected examples of the three dimensions, knowledge, skills, and attitude. Here I took the example of analyzing data, which is, uh, has the number C1 in the framework. Uh, examples of knowledge are you need knowledge about estimation methods and algorithms and knowledge about possible causes of artifacts. When you come to the skills, you need, uh, for example, the ability to represent measurable relationships and models and the ability to anticipate future uses of analysis results. And this will lead you directly to the examples of the attitudes, because when you can anticipate future uses of analysis, then um, the attitude should be analytical fairness. For example, the willingness not to perform analysis of the risk of misuse is high. So for example, if, if there is a risk of discrimination that can be done with the analysis. And then we also described ascending levels. One is the basic level, one is a more advanced level. And finally, we have the expert level. So expertise um, as a data scientist can be seen as a special case of data literacy on the expert level, as well as expertise as a, um, a data ethicist or expertise as a data journalist, for example. And on the other side, on the coding side, on the decoding side of the process, where it's about interpretation, I will give you an example how, in, how um, the competence D1, interpret data analysis, is structured. So we have as well examples of knowledge, like knowledge of statistical terminology and knowledge of statistical phologies, for example, that you know correlation is not necessarily causality. Skills that you need to have are you're able to draw conclusions about which characteristics of data a key figure made statements about. So what, what are the statements that you can give, can get for the information that you can get from a mean or from a median or from a, from a variance. And you can question to what, what extent the interpretation of the results depend on your own contextual knowledge and maybe also on your own prejudices. And this again leads us to examples of attitude, which is especially the openness to new findings, even if they contradict previous convictions. So this was a uh, theoretical background, including one example for the beginning. And now we have a short time, a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Uh, not for the moment, Katarina. I don't see questions, so I think you, you can go on. Okay, fine. Then I will go to my first application, which is the app Stadtland Datenfluss that I already mentioned in the beginning. The app Stadtland Datenfluss um, is, has the subtitle Data Literacy for Everyone. And that's the reason why it was created. So it was created as an app that will allow every citizen, at least every German speaking citizen, um, even though there's already now a beta version in English, to learn about data literacy, to learn how data affects our daily life in, in a more and more digitized world. So we started with defining the target groups and the motivation. 
And our first target group are people who are interested in the topic of data literacy and digitization, um, but on a very basic level. So they ask themselves questions like, data is used everywhere, but what do I get out of it? And aren't data and information the same thing? And I'm constantly reading terms like AI, IoT, big data. What is that actually? So in the beginning, we start with um, explaining the technologies behind digitization and the drivers of digitization, like big data, AI, Internet of Things, and data flow and communication, which is done in a in a basic learning unit in the middle in the virtual center of adult education. But even let me mention this, even if though we de designed the app for young adults to people of age 99 and maybe even older, we found that lots of teachers were interested in the app and asked us whether they could use it in their um, school teaching, teaching even younger students. And that's why there were also de was also developed some um, educational material for schools. And everything about this app is free. It's open educational material. It's under Creative Commons license. So it can be used freely. It can be adapted. It can be translated. So if you would like to use it in, in a different context, just get back to me or just get back to us. So after we um, clarify the basics, um, we will address another target group. Those are people who are a little bit familiar with those terms. They say, I know what big data and AI are, but how do they um, affect my life and how do they affect my daily job? And then we go out, we go out in this uh, virtual city in the Stadt. Stadt is a city in German or town. Um, and look at some use cases, look at concrete applications and discuss where does change through digitization take place. And the fields of application that we developed are health, it's mobility in smart city and work economy. And meanwhile, we also have one field of application, which is um, um, sustainable development. This is new and it has been added in 2022. And the questions we answer there is how can we act confidently in a digitized world? So we address digital skills, especially data literacy. There are 12 lessons, um, each containing consi consisting of three learning units and this, um, yeah, this unit for the basic knowledge in the center. We assumed that it takes about 15 minutes for each learning unit. So if you play with this app um, once a day, perhaps while you're on the train to work, this can be done in about 10 weeks, which is about three months. And this is a good time frame to really learn about data literacy. So we had to adapt the competence framework because the competence framework was developed for, um, for universities. And there is a larger focus on the coding process that means on providing data, collecting data, and analyzing data with statistical methods or machine learning methods in the different scientific areas like psychology, medicine, urban planning, and so on. But when you go to general education, adult education, um, the focus should be more on the application and on the interpretation, because when we open a newspaper or look at social media, we will see data everywhere, data products everywhere. Um, if not, if that hasn't been the case before 2020, it was definitely the case after the pandemic. So we um, aggregated the competence areas to three areas that are more related to everyday life. The most important one is acting on data and includes data sovereignty. What can, should, may happen with my data as the leading question here and a leading question for the area of data culture. What does data do? How can man and machine complement each other? The second area is classify data and information with two leading questions. One for questioning data, which information is in the data and which is not, and interpret information. What do the results that I get mean in context? And the third area is about using and protecting data. It's about consciously sharing data. How do I decide on my own responsibility about my data? And then the last one is about gaining data and information. How do you learn from data? How does the information value cycle work? So we avoided statistical terms. We avoided technical terms in the app. Some are hidden very deeply, um, but we try to make it as easily accessible as possible and to avoid technical terms. So this is a short overview of the learning object objectives that we derived. And as you can see here, 
In the rows, we have the leading questions related to the three areas. I just um, read them on the slide before. And then we have the three dimensions that we rephrased. So knowledge is about understanding, skills is about applying, and attitude is about evaluating. And A and B means those two different target groups. Once uh, target group A are the very beginners that really need to learn the basics, and target group B, they have a little knowledge already and they want to go deeper. So if you, for example, go into um, Classify data and information and the leading question, what do results mean in context, which is the fourth row, fourth row, and then we can go to apply. Then the learning goal for the first target group is can classify data and evaluations in the obvious context. And for the second target group, the little bit advanced target group classifies data and evaluations in a different manner in various contexts. So you can read through this once you have a look at the material. The structure and content of the course is that we, as I already said, have the virtual adult education center in the middle where um, it's described how those uh, dimensions work, how the different uh, technologies work like artificial intelligence and what's meant by internet of things and so on. This is mostly about gaining knowledge. So the dimension to understand, apply and evaluate um is is in the is when you go out into the city so we have those areas like the hospital which reflects the health area then we have the train station and also an airport which is about mobility and smart city and then you see some office buildings there you can learn about um, work in the 21st century and you also see the titles of the different learning units, for example, monitoring of body data, which is on level one, on the basic level. Um, or for example, when it's about mobility in the middle, we have uh, learning unit number three, the smart public space, which is on level two, so it's for the more advanced learners. Um, this is the learning past, path, a schematic learning path, and you can see that it reminds you a little bit of um, online games or of um, games that you can download from the App Store. So you play your, play your path, you play your way through the app, and you see what you've already um, played through, and you see a small lock in areas that you haven't played already. And it's all interconnected and you can jump in between. You can always go back and um, read something about the terms. So if there's something about big data and you haven't heard a word so far, you can get back. Yeah, there is a link within the app and you can read what it means. Um, and we also have some excursions. That means Outlook. This is a level C where we have exclusive interviews with experts, for example, from robotics or from urban planning, where they explain how data is used in their daily life and their science scientific area. And, and they explain it to the public and I can really recommend it. All those videos are also on YouTube. This is how the app look like, looks like, and you also see um, a small screenshot from the presentation that Angela Merkel gave when she introduced the app. And there's, as I said, there's also a version as a massive open online course, which you can access on the AI campus and the AI campus homepage. This is how it looks like, and you can, uh, there's a little difference to the app version, which I'll um, tell you about in a minute. Then here is a short overview on the chapters. You see there are different um, different exercises, different types of exercises. There's also video, there's also audio, and there is text. So it's a mixture of different, uh, or it addresses different learning styles. And if you compare app versus web, you see that it's also, um, also intended for different learning situations. So the app is more if you want to learn in a very informal setting, for example, when you're on your way to work, it can be downloaded from the app stores. It has an easy access. You don't need to log in. Everything is stored locally on your end device. And it's more an effective approach like playing, has short learning units, it's entertaining and um, it's more uh, selective learning on content. That means you have to follow the learning path. You cannot jump uh, between learning paths. Um, it's, 
sorry, it's designed for everyday life with very short text, um, a strong graphic design, and with animations. Whilst the browser version um, is accessible via the website, there's an optional login if you want to store your learning progress and the learning situations is more cognitive. That means um, if you want to do a longer learning sessions, 45 minutes or so, um, and want to concentrate more on learning, this is the right access point, then you should go to the, the browser version. And we have reduced graphs, but also more links to web content. There is an embedding option, for example, Wikipedia, and it can also be extended with didactic scenarios like peer learning. And you have access to advanced courses. There are many more courses on the AI campus that are related to AI and data literacy. And um, if you are on the platform already, then you can access them. This is uh, for my first example. And we have a little time for more questions now. Yes, Katarina, we received one question. Uh, it's about, do you see a difference between data literacy and digital literacy? Considering that the latter is often used to define ability of citizens to use internet apps, e-gov tools, etc., how do the concept overlap, or should they be combined? Um, I will show you uh, at the end of my my webinar. I will show you um, a standard that was developed by IEEE, and it's on digital literacy. Um, they they name it digital intelligence, and they see data and AI literacy as one element of digital literacy. Um, but I'd say digital literacy in a more in a narrower sense is more about dealing with digital information, knowing where to find information, but also knowing how to um, yeah how to deal with your your end devices, for example. Um, but it's it's no strict um, differentiation between digital literacy and data literacy. For example, if you look in the US, there is also a book on data literacy, which is which starts much earlier than our concept. And I talked with the authors and they told me, because you in Europe, you have the GDPR, so your citizens are protected somehow. But we need to teach our US citizens how to deal with digitization. And we need to start as, at a much earlier beginning, because if you are don't understand the basic elements of how to protect your data, how to protect your smartphone, um, then it's, it's like the Wild West. Everyone can do with your data whatever they want. So. Um, when you look at data literacy concepts in the United States, there are much more related to digital literacy or include also digital literacy components than those in the European context do. I hope this answered the question. Yeah, for my view, I think so. Otherwise, of course, uh, participants can continue to uh, post questions and comments uh, in the Q&A, but I suggest now to go on with the second application. Okay, great. So my second application is a course that uh, we developed at FENSTATS, the Federation of European National Statistical Societies in a European cooperation project, and also with the support of AI Campus. So um, we had an international working group on COVID-19 and statistical literacy. That was the beginning. And we had a funding from the AI Campus to develop an, open, an, an online course, which was um, again, funded by the German Ministry for Education and Research, and my company startup did the implementation. But how did we come to this idea? During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, decision makers and politics and business were in trouble, and that's what everyone knew. And we had a huge discussion on that in Fenstad and said we want to collect um, best practice examples, how COVID-19 is dealt with in terms of data and statistics in other European countries or in European countries and other countries around the world. Um, because we saw there were sometimes conflicting interests and the politics um, had the really difficult task to take decisions in a very uncertain situation where we really did not have much information, at least in the beginning. And there were, uh, there was also the task to find compromises to minimize the damage in all areas of public and private life, like health, economy, also education, psychosocial impact, and so on. So we collected best practices from Europe and the rest of the world, but what then? So, okay, of course, we could, uh, could put them on the website, which we also did. 
But then we thought, what should we do with it? Should we write another paper that no one will read because there was already one million papers? So we decided to develop an online course that allows users to explore how data-driven decisions are made and what the limitations of using data in such a complex decision-making situations are. And we also used this opportunity to test the data literacy framework and see if, if, if it would work to support decision making in a very complex situation like a pandemic. So the goals and intended target groups here were politicians and journalists, but also managing directors and companies that had to decide about measures and the general public interested in how decision making based on data should work. So we wanted to show how data can be used to improve and support decision making and to understand the principles, opportunities, and also the limitations of data decision making, because not every decision, especially not in a democracy, can be taken based upon data. So there need to be other decision making processes and data informed decision making is only one of them. And that's also why I prefer the term data informed decision making to emphasize that data is not everything, that there are other sources of information and other processes that are needed to take informed decisions. The data is there for information, but data is not there to calculate the decision itself. So the course um, has eight chapters. There's an introduction chapter that describes how data and information must always be embedded in context. Then we follow the six competence areas, the competence steps from the data literacy framework. Start with establishing a data culture, which is about planning on what information and data is important, as well as planning on what can be left out. That means, what are we talking about when we talk about managing a pandemic? Is it only about direct health implications like uh, registered or confirmed cases? hospitalizations and deaths? Is it also about indirect health effects uh, like um, operations that cannot be done during the time of the pandemic? Is it also about other um, aspects of society like the economy or education? So what is included? What should we think about? Because what we do not have an, 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 what we do not focus, where we do not have a certain perspective, that we won't collect data. And where we don't have data, we cannot control it. We cannot, what we do not measure is what we cannot ma manage. And this is really important to understand at the very beginning that decisions taken there will affect the whole process and the whole decision making in the end. So the next step is providing data. How can we collect necessary data and get to know different ways to do so? then exploit data, how can we generate useful data and avoid the misuse of visualizations? How can we interpret results and interpret the data, which is also about the relevance and reliability of the data? And finally, how can actions be derived and evaluated? And the last chapter, chapter is about reca recapitulation. It summarizes the content and um, also gives again the statement that data can support decision making but it should not replace decision-making. So I will give you a quick overview on some elements of the course. At the beginning, we have the role of indicators, mortality indicators. And as you can see here, there, is, there are lots of questions um, and there's a lot, lot of small exercises um, that you can go through. They are in the form of little quizzes that you can take, but you can take them as often as you want to. So it's nothing about pass or fail. It's it's about learning and having hopefully have some fun with learning. One other um, element of the course it's, is about forecasts and their limits. What can forecasts do, but what cannot forecasts do? And also shows how forecasts change over time how they are um, re-evaluated and how they need to be corrected over the course of time when more information is collected. And it does not mean that a forecast itself is wrong, but it needs to be understood what a forecast can be used for, what it's useful for and what not. So it's not about knowing exactly what will happen in the future, but to give you some, some boundaries to give you some guidance to understand what's, for example, the best case or the worst case that can happen given a certain information level that we have at the moment, and then to help us decide on whether we can accept the worst case, whether it's acceptable for us as a society or not. And then if we see the worst case is not acceptable, then we need to take some measures um, 
it's not that does not mean that we surely know that the worst case will happen but it's about risk management and it's not about knowing about the future it's about dealing with risk and uncertainty um here is a lesson that that shows how definitions determine data it's what i already explained in the beginning definitions that we take will have um uh, an effect on the data that we collect to fulfill those definitions. And here we can also see the effect of sample sizes, um, for example, on the confidence intervals. Here is an example that shows how inference can be taken from samplers. We have a really nice illustration that uses the, the process of cooking spaghetti um, to gain information about when the spaghetti is ready, how will you test it, and should you take a sample from the top of, of the pot or from the bottom of the pot or from the middle of the pot to understand if your spaghetti is ready. This is about um, doing representative sampling. I'm not sure if this example came from our Italian colleagues, but um, I think it's uh, everyone in, in Europe would understand it. And this is something I really, really like. It's we, we have also included interactive apps. So they are programmed and are shiny. And those interactive apps help you to play around with data and also play around with assumptions on the data. Because one really important lesson here is it's not only about data. We also need to take assumptions what this da these data mean in context. For example, we have confirmed cases. We collect confirmed cases. But what does that mean? Confirmed cases, the number of confirmed cases depend, of course, on the incidents that we do not know, and they depend on the reproduction factor that we also do not know. This is the truth, but we do not know. We can only try to measure it as appropriate, as, as correct as possible. But it also depends on the quality of the tests that we use, on the sensitivity and specificity of corona tests that we have, and it depends on the testing strategy. It depends on whether we do representative testing, if we do a mass testing, or if we only test people who have symptoms. And if we switch from one testing strategy to another, everything will get confused. And this is what the app shows. You can play around with different te testing strategies with a different with tests of different quality, and it will show you, given a certain true but unknown reproduction rate and incidence in the population how far away you are with your estimation of incidence and reproduction rate that you get from the registered cases, from the confirmed cases, so that you get an idea how much the, the information, the knowledge that you gain not only depends on the data, but also on the way how you collect the data and what you believe that the data mean. There's another app which um, covers another aspect of society. This is about short time working policies. So it's about the economy and um, the, yeah, the situation in Germany was that we had this short time, um, short time working for a while where employees could stay at home, but get 60% of their net income, sometimes a bit more, but 60%. But if you think about that, we have a definition of relative um, relative poverty, which means if a household has less than 60% of the median income of comparable households, that means in theory, if you send people to short-time work, they will be poor, at least on, in statistical terms, which is obviously not exactly happening, but all be because also the median will move when you send people, or when you pay um, everyone less, um, less money. Um, so it's all interconnected, what, but what you can see here, you change the percentage loss of working hours and the percentage of people with reduced working, and you see how this affects the statistical um, measure of poverty, and you can also see how it affects different population groups, for example, men and women. And finally, when you've completed the course, you can get a certificate, a record of achievement that describes what you have learned in the course yeah, and the learning outcomes. And I will quickly um, go to the outlook now. So where are we at the moment? What are the next steps? The data literacy charter and the standard for data and AI literacy. The data literacy charter is summarized here. It has a preamble um, describing the purpose, the goals of data literacy. So we want 
um, people, business and scientific institutions, as well as governmental or civil society organizations to actively participate in opportunities to use data, deal confidently and responsibly with, with one's own and other people's data and use new drivers and technologies to meet individual needs, address societal challenges and solve global problems. We derived five guiding principles for the data literacy. First one is data literacy must be accessible to all people, so it should not be an expert knowledge, it should be available for everyone. Data literacy must be taught throughout life in all areas, education, from cradle to cradle, from um, early childhood education, um, but also in extracurricular and vocational training, and of course, in teacher training and in higher education in high schools and universities. It must be taught as a transdisciplinary competency across all subjects, and we want three perspectives. One is the application-oriented perspective, what is to be done, then the technical methodological, how is it to be done, and the social cultural, what is it to be done for, so what is the purpose, what do we want to achieve? Fourth guiding principle is data literacy must systematically cover the entire process of insight and decision making with data and it must include knowledge, skills and values. That means the three dimensions and ethics is really important here. You can find the data literacy charter in German and in English on the internet and I also will provide you some links at the end. Now we are on the way to a global standard. So we get asked by IEEE whether we um, would like to translate the data literacy framework and maybe also the charter into a global standard for data literacy. And then we also decided that we want to include it, include AI literacy, because this will also be a very important skill in the future. And what I what I show here on the left side of my slide is the standard I mentioned before, the DQ standard. DQ stands for Digital Intelligence and it covers 24 competencies in eight areas. And in the area of digital literacy, there is data and AI literacy as one of the competencies here, but it's described really short. Um, it's here described or defined as the ability collect, to collect, manage, evaluate and apply data and to develop, use and apply artificial intelligence and related algorithmic tools and strategies in a critical manner in order to guide, inform, optimize and contextually relevant decision making processes. So you see as well, here is a focus on decision making and also on, yeah, on the maybe softer skills like ethics and communication and so on. So now the scope of our um, our standard that we want to develop is to establish a global standard that encompasses the common framework to ensure the data and AI literacy building efforts are coordinated globally, which also includes governments, governmental institutions that want to um, want to foster data literacy education and or schools. It can also be applied in universities. It can be applied in companies that want to do vocational training or offer vocational training and so on. So as I said, the standard is built upon the data literacy framework and the data literacy charter, and it combines perspectives both from academia and industry and from different countries and cultures and different, yeah, different areas of life. So the process, in short, starts with a project approval process. So we've gone through the step and now we are in the step of developing the draft standards and working groups, which usually takes two to five years, uh, which is the development process. So we have been working on that for a bit more than one year. So it will take at least six to 12 more months or even more. Um, then the standard needs to be approved in the standards board and then finally it will be published and it's then valid for at least uh, for, for a maximum of 10 years before it needs to be revised or with, withdrawn. If we find in 10 years um, after publishment that there is no need for a standard for data literacy anymore, then it can be withdrawn, but I think that will not be the case. Um, what we did here, again, a systematic review and um, I just... Uh, included this slide because it shows this kind of clash of cultures that we have when we came as German scientists and said, okay, we have to start and research the literature, what's already there on data and AI literacy. And then American practitioner said, this is not a study group. We start with what we have. So you have a draft with the data literacy framework. So let's bring this into a standard. 
And um, this is something that I really learned interdisciplinary work is really, really hard. You spend a lot of time talking about what you are talking about because we use lots of different terms and that's something we need to find out. Um, so for example, um, this is this is a short overview on, on the draft, how it should look like. Um, certain words that we use here have a special meaning, so it really makes a difference if you write it shall, it should, it may, or it can. So this has a certain meaning in a standard and you really need to properly use those words. There is a predetermined structure and a standardized content. For example, we need to include definitions, abbreviations, and acronyms. And here's an example on different meaning of certain words. We had a discussion with computer science, whether an indicator is a measure or not, whether an indicator does always mean it's measurable, or perhaps it never means it's measurable. So we had really different ideas on the meaning of this word or this term. And this is something that needs to defi be defined in the beginning so that we're clear what we are talking about. Here is a sneak preview on our draft. It looks pretty much like uh, the data literacy framework, the tables that I showed before, but we have um, organized them a little bit different so that it's clearer to see what refers to the dimensions. That means knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and what are examples of ascending levels. And what we introduced here is a new definition. So instead of examples, we say competence demonstrator, which is a very concrete example that shows how the competence can be measured, how it can be, yeah, how it's demonstrated in a certain context. And this refers to another standard and another IEEE standard, the 7000 2021 which is a standard uh, defining a uh, reference process how ethical considerations can be taken in, into account from the beginning when you develop an automated system or an algorithmic system. So in, in short, it's a, a standard for ethics by design. And this standard uses the term value demonstrator, which describes how a certain value in a society is demonstrated in a certain context. And to um, show this parallel, we invented the term competence demonstrator, which will now be used throughout the standard. So um, if there is anyone who would like to join our working group, we are open. It's open. Everyone can join um, as a as a voting member, non-voting member, or just an informal member. There are some rules how you can get from one stage into another, but also you can just get back to me if you want to join and want to discuss. And my last slide shows you some further reading. Um, I will send this also out to you after the webinar. And yeah, I, I hope now you have some questions or, um, yeah, I'm here for yes, discussions. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Katarina. Indeed, we received one question from Julia, um, a question and a comment, I think. Uh, data culture is a thing we, which can't develop or foster only with courses, webinars, and apps. You need to work with people directly and in interaction. Uh, what are your plans or ideas about that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. This can only be the beginning, but there should be some material that's available for everyone because not everyone can has the opportunity or, or maybe also can afford to join a course or a class or not everyone has a working context where someone offers you training on data literacy. But what we do when we work with organizations is, for example, um, we, uh, we create exchange groups, we create user groups where people can discuss, where they can teach each other. So it's about peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is also something that's possible on the AI campus. And the AI campus is not only for self-studying, it's not only for doing the courses by yourself, but it's also used by different universities who take the courses as a basis for their classes. Um, for university teachers, they adapt the courses, they combine it with other material and teach in person or teach in, in uh, yeah, virtual courses. But there is also the application and, and practice. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a comment and I mean a, a curiosity because I, I consider it was very interesting the collaboration uh, within the FANSTAT, which I think was uh, very successful. So is something also going on? Uh, I mean, after this collaboration, are you going on uh, in, for other applications or something like that at European level, I would say? <laughs> well, 
it took quite a while to create yeah. this course. So um, now it's a little bit time to relax, but um, I'm sure we will work on, on other courses and there will be expansions, translations of the courses. I, I know that many people are interested in how this mm -hmm. can be applied in their setting. And as I said, it's open educational resource. So if anyone wants to apply it and wants to use it, um, there will also be um, perhaps an opportunity to to work on further developments or further adaptions of the courses. Um, but I've seen there was another question in the chat that is, I've never mentioned metadata. Metadata oh. is mentioned in the data literacy framework and it's mentioned in the standard. I just didn't give an example um, due to the limited time here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we are... Uh... Basically, I have to finish just the last very quick question for, uh, for my side. I mean, I generally ask this. Do you think our EMO students, so experts, they are studying methods and, uh, I mean, for official statistics and also the structure of the ESS? So I think they can play a role in this data uh, literacy framework. What do you think? Definitely. And we yeah. really, really need your feedback. So if you have feedback on the course, if you say there's something I don't understand, something that could be done better, this is all, this can all be work in progress and we can, can adapt the courses. We can um, enhance the courses as it was done with the app Stadtland Datenfluss. In the beginning, we had only those three areas. Um, now we have sustainable development and I think there will be more in the future. So if you give us feedback, if you tell us this is a really important field that should be included, a really important application, just get back to me, get back to us, get back to Fenstats and give us your ideas and we're really, really happy to discuss with you. Okay, thank you, Katarina. We have uh, only a, a last comment in the chat, but it's not a question. So I think we... Uh, now time is closed. We have to finish. We have to close. So thank you again, Katarina, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, and many thanks, of course, also to all our participants. Mm -hmm. So as participants, you are invited to fill in a short survey about today's webinar. The uh, survey will open your browser just after the end of this Zoom meeting. If you don't have time right now, you will receive a link by email to fill in the survey later on. We really appreciate your feedback to further improve our e EMOS webinar. So the next webinar is scheduled on December the 15th when Professor David Aziza from the University of Ottawa will be presenting on machine learning procedures for the treatment of unit non-response in surveys. So for these and for future webinars, uh, please keep an eye uh, to our website. So I'm going to add uh, for you the link in the chat. And uh, uh, thank you. So thank you very much to everybody for joining us. And uh, yeah, yeah, you have the link. So keep an eye and please, uh, we'll be happy if you join us for our future webinars. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for now and have a nice day to everybody. <laughs>